but trying to expand globally. Long curly hair and a beard, but he ain't Toby Keith. You might have thought it's beef, but we gon' handle that. Stealing jerseys off of the wall like fuck Banda Jack. Okay, he ran with that, and now he's on the loose. Put a little bit of poison in his jamba juice. Go ahead and drink on that, just take another sip. Need an appraisal, shout out to Ron Huff and Dick. The kids loving this. I know you heard it, son. The purpose is perfect. Every person we learn something from. Go ahead and come along. We have a little fun. A few questions. How about 31? Huh, 31. I love it. I love that song. So the best intro ever made, without a doubt. Shout out to Garrett. Uh, it's good to be back. We're doing a 31. Got a special 31 for you today. It is a repeat guest. Uh, he was actually my second guest ever. He was co-host of the Crab Feast. It is my good buddy, Jay Larson. I got some new questions for him. And honestly, I'm going to ask him some of the old ones because that was five years ago. And I'm sure some things have changed. Some things have definitely changed. Uh, shout out to everybody. Thanks for giving rate, review, subscribe. Uh, I think we're up to like 515 reviews, which is great because some douche on uh, the internet yesterday called me out. He was like, you have a podcast. You only have one review. I was like, bitch, look at this shit. Sorry about it. Five stars. 515, I think, in your fucking nerd face. Then he deleted my comment and blocked me, which is okay because he sucks anyway. But anyway, uh, shout out to everybody. If you haven't done it, it just takes a second. Just throw up, uh, just give a thumbs up, five star review, subscribe, get these episodes. You know, we're putting out episodes every week. Like I said, I'm recording this right now with Jay on a Friday afternoon. I'm going to go tonight and record the best selling. Then next week, I got Santino coming in hot, and I've already begged Comedy Works to let me open for Theo. So, I don't know if Theo will do it, but I would love to have Theo Vaughn on here. And that was some of your guys' dream guest was to get Theo Vaughn, so we're going to shoot for that. Um, shout out to the Patreons. Thank you, guys. We finally made it to 31, which is awesome. Let's push now. Let's try to get to 50. I'm going to do something special if we get to 50, but I'm working on – I told you guys to get in the first 31. If you guys didn't, you were going to be sick when you see what, uh, what these first 31 Patreons get. I'm telling you, it's – what I'm going to make, it's being made, it's $7 a month, so that's what, $84 a year. What what I'm making for you for 31 Patreons, you'll make your money back in like a day if you want to. It's going to be life-changing, and it's going to make the podcast more fun. So if you haven't done it, just go to patreon.com, put in Brant Tolber, the content factory, come on board at 7 bucks a month. And uh, I let you in. I send you private messages. I got. I still have these postcards that I couldn't send, but there's a reason for that that you guys will understand. And uh, you get special shit. You get cool free tickets. And uh, you get to come to our wedding or come to our house. Patreons have already slept on my couch. Came over at dinner. Uh, you know, they do cool shit. So i'm gonna shout out my girl robin she's sending me something cool i'm gonna give her a shout out on dead to us because that's her favorite podcast with me and shire like i said uh we got the koozies last week this podcast studio is decorated from the patreon so it's cool i love it i love it and i love you guys and i thank you guys for listening every week it's fun to watch these numbers go up and um I'm not, you know, I saw Tom Segura and Christina P. bought like a $7 million mansion this week. I'm not trying to get to that, but I am just trying to make a little money. So if I need stitches one day, it won't make my phone get shut off. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks for everybody for joining in. And uh, that's enough of the bullshit. Let's make this call. Let's get this shit going. Let's call Jay Larson. I'm excited to talk to him. I haven't talked to him in a while. You've seen him on Conan. He has a sp- he just put out a Christmas special, which was awesome. He has his own special on jlarson.com, which I recommend. I was at the live taping uh, in Hollywood. It's called Me Being Me, and it was awesome. It was shot so good. It's just a really good special. So you can get that at his website, jlarson.com. He's got legendary Conan bit, and he's uh, one of the first people to really be nice to me in L.A., so I'll always be grateful. So uh, let's call him up. Let's call Jay Larson. Here we go. Yeah. 
Yo, buddy. Jay Larson, how are you, buddy? BT. I'm well, buddy. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. What's going on? Chilling, man. Chilling? Chilling. How's the family good? Been, uh, yeah, they're good, dude. My son's been on break from school, so we've been uh, a lot of bike ride practicing, doing homework, um, playing Legos, stuff like that. Nice. A new bike? Yeah, A man. Christmas bike, or he's already had it? Dude, let me tell you something, okay? <laughs> you're not getting a new bike until you're, like, 11. You know, I'm Craigslisting everything. They, 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 they grow out of the bike in, like, eight months. You know what I mean? I bet, yeah. I never think about that My part. buddy, yeah, my friend was like, yeah, I'm buying my kid a bike. It's 250 bucks. I go, are you out of your goddamn mind? For what, dude? <laughs> Is he a BMX freestylist? Is he making money? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's just gonna probably crash it a lot anyway, and then what? It well, what was you know it? What? We'll just crash the bike anyway and mess it all up. So you might as well do a used one. Well, what was the what was the big gift for the kids? What did they want? What did, what did they want Santa to bring them? They they go through with all the like they're super into Legos and super into Star Wars. So Kate like crushes all that stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She's like, all right, I'm gonna get this, this. I'm like, do it, and she's like on top of it, and we. I mean, honestly, like this year, like the night before Christmas, I was just looking at like all the gifts from like their aunts, uncles, us, Santa, uh, neighbors. I was like, this is too much. This is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy. I go, look at this. This is way too much. Way too much. She's like, I know. I'm like, make sure we are dialing back. And like, we're going to have to, I said to him, like, I'm sending an email to your brothers and sisters and telling them one gift. This is insane. What's going on around here. But, you know, they loved it. They get yeah. up, they were, like, all about Legos. I mean, dude, we're still putting Legos, like, new Legos together. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. Well, I've always wondered, how's that work? So you you buy them a Lego thing, and then you build it, and then are they over it? Or they still play with it? or? Yeah, so then they play with it, right? And then it breaks. And then, like, <laughs> I, I, said to, I said to them the other day, I'm like, here's the deal. I'm going to build you guys a shelving unit for your room. Because, like, in their room, there's this area of, like, we have like bookshelves up for books, but I built a bookshelf that's like on another side of the room. And I, we've downsized. We had so many books. We downsized, donated a ton of books. Now we got the books dialed into like the ones that we're reading all the time. Cause now he's like, now we take books out of the library and he, we're reading Harry Potter with him. So we're on one book. And then he has like a couple Lego books that he likes to read. You know what I mean? But yeah. a lot of these other ones you grow, you grow out of. So I'm going to take this area and build a shelving unit. So that when we build a Lego toy, you put ones that you're not using up there so they don't get, like, crashed. Cause, dude, we live in a very tiny house. We don't have a lot of room, you know? And it's like, otherwise, you're just crashing these things, and then you don't <laughs> use them, and then they go into the Lego drawer. And it's like, you know, what was the point of that, dude? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always hear parents complaining about the Legos all over. Well, shit, you know what? Let me ask you this. What was, what was the best Christmas present you've ever gotten? Honestly, dude, I never, I can't. I couldn't tell you a single Christmas gift I've ever got. Really? I don't know. If, I just don't know if I don't have a good memory. I, I remember, like, I can tell you this is how this is how femininely raised I was. I can tell you the colors of the sofa in the room, how the tree looked, when we would light the fire, where what the temperature was in that room, how long we would wait, what the light of the sun coming in through that front window was like. What the you know what I mean? Everything yeah. in that room. I have no idea what I got. <laughs> that's funny yeah i guess i do remember my mom you know being a single mom on christmas morning was just like out cold and seeing how much my you know it was me my brother and my wife doing all the wrapping the night before and prepping for like the dinner the next day you're just like man we didn't go to bed till one o'clock in the morning i'm like could you imagine my mom solo four kids yeah. Trying to be quiet, get stuff out of the attic to go then wrap. Like some stuff she would just like, if it was like a bigger thing, put it this way. I was, when it comes to a bike, when we were like practicing with my, I was practicing with my son today. He's just not, he's just not into it. He's not like a super like, let's go play baseball for five hours. He's like, uh-huh. dad, let me give you an example of this kid. I was getting frustrated with him doing his homework. He had this, he had to write a story, right? It took mm-hmm. us an hour and a half. I don't tell him how to spell words. I sound them out. I'm like, all right, here you go. And we sound it every letter and he goes through and he's got to think of the story. And I don't, I don't, I try not to lead the witness. I want it to come out of his brain. So it gets a little frustrating, right? Mm-hmm. 
And every now and then, you know, Larson runs a little hot. Everybody <laughs> knows I run a little hot. And he just looks at me, and he's, he's five. He looks at me and goes, Dad, do you have to get so frustrated? <laughs> That's who my kid is. He's not like, let's go break windows. Yeah. So get him to ride a bike. So today I was like telling him, I'm like, I'm like, I go read. You know who taught me how to ride a bike? This is, I don't know why I try to talk to my kid like this. I go, you know who taught me to ride a bike? And he goes, who? And I go, me. There was no one around. <laughs> me. And I go, I fell all the time. And I go, and guess what? It wasn't my bike. It was your Auntie Kristen's, your Auntie Courtney's, and your Uncle Adam's. Everyone got one bike. And it was giant. Like, I learned to ride a bike. I think I was older. Like, maybe seven. I can still uh-huh. remember the bike. I can remember doing it in the driveway. I remember falling constantly. Um, so yeah, I don't remember any Christmas gifts. I wish I had. I remember one of my sisters once, Courtney got a leather jacket. I don't know if it was real, but it was like Top Gun. It just came out. And I remember looking at it being like, holy shit. My sister's the coolest person on the planet. (laughs) She got a leather jacket, dude. Had like the fur collar and shit. Well, what about like when you're shopping for your wife? Is that, do you enjoy that or? No, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. You know why I hate it? Because I don't know what it is. I don't know if this is what I was like before kids, but like once you have kids, you don't think of anything else. Like you just mm-hmm. think about, like my wife never likes Valentine's Day. I love flowers, dude. There are flowers in my house 82% of the year, and mm-hmm. I, it's me buying them. My wife never buys flowers. So it's not like if I come home with flowers, it's a special thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. My wife works in jewelry. You can't even buy this chick jewelry. That's what she does. She has all this jewelry from work. Like I bought her a ring, I think for her birthday or anniversary one year. It's like a nice vintage, beautiful matched her like wedding ring. And like, that's the only jewelry I've ever bought her because like, I mean, she gets like, they crush her with jewelry. Uh So like when it comes to like buying it, so usually I always buy some clothes. What are you doing? I'm doing a podcast right now. You can uh, you can hang out, but you gotta sit in that chair quiet, okay? <laughs> so, like, I used to just buy her clothes, dude. And then I was just like, what's the point of me buying her clothes? All I ever buy her is, like, it's tough to buy her pants or skirts. I usually just buy her sweaters, you know what I mean? Or cool sweatshirts. And then she's just like, all the cool sweatshirts are for me. And then it's like, you know, what am I trying to do? She's a, you know, I'm yeah. buying her sweatshirts and sweaters. You know what I mean? It just got, yeah. this year, I just, this is this is also the thing that I do. We were like, all right, let's not spend a lot of money on each other. And we were like, yep, 100%. We're trying to save money. And then I, I was at a comedy store, and I'm like, yo, anybody have an idea of like what I should buy my wife? And Lisa Schrager was like, how about like tickets to a play? And that's something that Kate and I love to do. We probably mm-hmm. go four times, maybe six times a year to plays or musicals. And I was like, all right. So I bought tickets to Hamilton. Nice. Do you know how much tickets to Hamilton are, bro? Uh, a lot <laughs> out of my There's crash a range. Lot. <laughs> yeah, out of mine, dude. We're trying to save money, and here I go. I bought tickets to Hamilton, what? and I think she was like so mad on Christmas because I got like t-shirts and a golf shirt and golf shorts, and I'm sitting here dropping Hamilton tickets. But I got it for us, you know. That yeah, wasn't yeah. like a ticket. That was, you know, that was a that was a gift for us. What's it? What's Hamilton cost you? Can you say? Yeah, I can. Say. I'm just curious. Don't you have to be like in a I lottery mean, to get them? Or I, they just announced that they're coming here to Denver, and people are like freaking out. But then I was reading all these articles. I think they've been like, to LA a couple times. Like they yeah. probably won't even get one because they're so hard to get. Yeah, these were. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened too. I went to buy them online. I found them for like a decent price, like up in the mezzanine. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I was like, all right, perfect. I go to check out. Guess how much the surcharge charge was uh, per ticket? I'm sure ridiculous. Uh, whatever they want to charge, because w- once you know you got them, you're gonna. Yeah. There's no way out there. But yes. Probably what do what? you think is a ridiculous uh, surcharge? Anything, I, anything over like ten dollars is. Re- I don't even know why they need any of it, but I'm sure it's gonna be way more than that. How about it was one hundred and three dollars per ticket? Oh my god! Yeah, one hundred three dollars. <laughs> oh god. So I called the box office. I'm like, "Yo, one hundred three bucks." They're like, "Well, that's a third party, sir. They do that." Blah blah blah. And I go, what if I come into the box office? They're like, oh, yeah, there'll be zero surcharge. I'm like, all right, I'll see you in 20, uh, you know, 40 minutes. Yeah. Grab the kids. We roll up there. I go, I have the date in mind. I already called my in-laws who are coming to Arizona in March. And I go, could you guys tack on two days? Come out here because we have a, Kate and I have a free night stay at a hotel in town. We wanted an auction for the kids' school. 
And I'm like, let me make a night of it. I'll make reservations at a nice restaurant. We have the hotel. And then I'll have my in-laws so we don't have to worry about a sitter, you know. So they're like, yeah. So I go to the box office. I'm like, yeah, I tried to buy these online with the surcharge. It was crazy. They're like, oh, my God. It's so ridiculous. And I'm like, great. So I go, all right. So I'm looking at this date. They're like, yep, here's the seating chart. I'm like, yeah, I want to go up in the mezzanine. They go, oh, there's no tickets left for the mezzanine. Oh. I go, what do you mean? I just saw them online. They go, yeah, that's the third party. They buy them all up. And I go, all right, so what's available? And they go, down, down here. Oh, so no. I had to, it cost me the same amount of, yeah. I just got better seats. $450 a ticket. <sighs> wow. It was ridiculous. But you know what? Everyone's been talking about this musical. It's been the number one musical in the world for like seven years straight. Yeah. It's supposed to be insane. So it's like, you know, we went to Phantom of the Opera this year and it was, yeah, it was good. It was very good. But like, let's go to something that's fresh and maybe like eye opening and, and, uh, you know, yeah. feel like we spent too much money, you know? Well, I'll say this. I know a lot of people have done it. Nobody's ever complained after. Nobody ever said they didn't get their money's worth. So. It'll be cool that you can, <laughs> you can go. Oh, maybe I could be that guy. Yeah. I didn't like it. Ever, uh, that's one of my favorite gags. One yeah. of my favorite gags is like to be hanging out with people and they talk about like a movie they loved and it's like a classic. Dude, don't break that, man. Because I kind of need it. <laughs> and uh, so like to take the movie Starface and people are like, uh-huh. oh, that movie's unbelievable. Like, I'm like, I agree. The movie was great. But I'll be honest, Pacino, come on. It's a little over the top for me. <laughs> I did it the other day. My girlfriend was so annoyed. We went, they have a big Monet exhibit here. And I was just like bored by it. There were just so many like pretentious people there talking yeah. to each other about like they knew shit. And I would just be like, I would just say to my girlfriend shit like, ah, she's pretty good. And then people would just snap, look at me or I'd just be like, how much is this one? And then I thought it was funny, but my girlfriend probably won't take me anywhere else soon. But that'd be hilarious. Just walk up to you like, listen, it's okay, but he's no money. You know yeah. What I mean? <laughs> yeah. It was just too pretentious to me. It was weird. I don't know. It was, she, I, I t- drag her to so many crappy comedy shows. I got to go to, to stuff she likes occasionally. So, yeah. How well, often? You know, you can also like. How often? What? I was just say. How often does your wife go to shows? Uh, not that often anymore. Like mm-hmm. we'll like plan a night. I'll be like, hey, do you want to come? You know, if it's like going to be like a fun show or a fun night or someone else is in town and they're going to come to a show. Do you think that would be a good idea, dude? No. And uh, so, like, she comes to show. You know, we like to go to art a lot. I don't, just don't think about the other people. Because if you do look at it, you're like, man, this stuff is, it could be boring. But, like, we, we took the kids to the Broad Museum, which is like, a little more contemporary than, like, going to see, like, Impressionists. And, like, it just blows me away. Like, I look at these paintings and I'm like, I can't, I have zero artistic skills as far as drawing or painting or sketching and I look at it and I'm like, God, it just blows my mind. Like sometimes I have to look away. I'm like, I can't even, like, yeah. God, I could never, no, I I'm, can't I'm, I'm the same. I'm awful. And I, I could respect just how amazing it was, but, uh, then I just got annoyed by people around me, but no, I, I agree. Like, cause I'm, I'm with you. I can't, I have no talent, it, art talent. So I was like, the, holy shit, this dude just sat outside and painted this. Here's the main question. Did you pay to get in or did you sneak into no, that? No, we paid. My girlfriend doesn't. She's not uh, just sneaking in yet. No wonder why. No wonder why yeah. you weren't into it. <laughs> you know what? It would have been. The guy I'm talking to, Reed, sneaks in everywhere. That's his whole thing. He sneaks in places. I know. Do you want to sneak in places? Well, you're going to have the law after you just like him. You don't want With that. the law after you? He'd make What's it. What's the law? <laughs> Ah, you're making me so jealous, man. I want kids so bad. It's got to be the funnest thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, definitely. I think the highs outweigh the lows. Yeah, well, I don't. I never see the lows, but I just see like all the pictures you post, and then and my my uh, friends with kids always tell me I just come over and have the fun, and then wear them out. They're like, you have yeah. a lot to learn about the full parenting, but yeah, they're pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're they're pretty amazing. They're pretty, oh, I'm sure we like them. I just love listening to you talk to him right now. Um, let me ask you a couple more. Uh, when's the last time you bled? I mean, like, seriously? Yeah. Um, I cut my shin the other day. But here's the deal. Like, I'm getting old, and, like, a little scrape turns into, like, you look at my leg, and you're like, oh, my God, did you did you fall down a cliff? And you're like, no, I <laughs> bumped it on my bed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, so there's been like no, I can't remember the time like I seriously bled. Uh huh. Well, that's like good. It, 
I know the first time this guy right next to me bled though. What That's ha- a pretty good story. What happened to him? He was like, he was like, he was like three months old, and my wife was going out of town for the first trip mm-hmm. since she was like back off maternity leave. So she had never been without him. She was going on her first trip, and he, his fingernails were getting long. And I said to her, I'm like. Yeah, we got to cut these fingernails. And she was like nervous to cut his fingernails, you know, because you're like, I don't know, you know, it's a kid. You know, you you just want everything with him is new. So as soon as she left for the airport, I'm like, all right, I'm going to cut those fingernails. He doesn't know, you know, he's four months. So I start cutting, I start cutting, I get to the thumb and I clip and his fingernail goes, the whole top of his finger goes white. Oh. Oh no. And like completely white. I look up at his face, his mouth is wide open. He's screaming, but no sound is coming out. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's, and and I look back down, and then blood just starts pouring out, and then the volume of the screech was so loud. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then I then I called your mom. I called his mom, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Hey, I'm like, I was just doing this, and I don't know, dude. I never even single mom in my house. I never had Neil's porn in my house. You got yeah. a, you got a gas. You put a bandaid on it." So I call my wife. I'm like, what should I do? And she's kind of like in panic mode. She's like, oh my God. I, um, I don't know. Just put like some rubbing alcohol on it and then just put a Band-Aid on it. <laughs> Bruh, do you know? Everyone oh, I've gosh. told this to that's like a parent is yeah. like, what? I put the rubbing alcohol on, dude, and this kid hit like, I mean, we got calls from the city. Like, is everything okay? <laughs> we got, it was insane. Literally, my neighbor's kid from four, no, one, two, two houses down, came down with lemonade and cookies, and they're like, uh, my mom said you probably need this right now. <laughs> Gosh, I bet that rubbing alcohol would, that'd make me scream as an adult. Yeah, yeah. oh my the, God. Is that the first Train. time he ever heard that story? No, I think he's heard it before. But it's funny, it's like, a, it's like a country tongue. The first time I saw my son bleed, uh-huh. or the, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I made him, I made my son bleed for the first time or something like that. Or, I don't remember. I mean, I'm, could, I'm never crazy blood of you. No, not. Well, you know, at one time I dove for a football when I was like 10 and hit a parking sign right in the forehead. And then I bled. And the only reason I remember bleeding so much is because I went over to my friend's house to like call my mom. I didn't know what to do. And then I bled all over my buddy's deck and his dad still to this day. If he sees me, he'll be like, there's Brant Tober bled all over my good deck, and I was like, so that's the only reason I even remember it because he was so mad at me. And then I got stitches in the top of my forehead, but I couldn't play soccer. Or I could play soccer, I just couldn't head the ball, which is weird at ten years old because you're, you know, you just play. I didn't, I didn't have the sense. You just play. So, so then I had, I headed it one time, and my mom pulled me out, and I couldn't play till it healed up, which was the ultimate pain. It was way worse than the blood. Oh my god! I remember in fifth grade we were like sledding. And dude, fifth grade, I would leave my house and walk across town. I mean, I grew up in a little town yeah. and then just like sled all day. So I'm like sledding with Gerard Lehman and Mike O'Toole and me and Gerard are on the tube heading down and Mike's like walking up the hill and he decides oh, I'll jump on. So he jumps on, lands on my face and my face, I go all the way down the hill with one cheek all the way in the, the ice the whole way, rip my whole oh. face, like the whole face. And like we went to Gerard's house to like bandage up. His mom was like, "Oh my, what is what happened?" And then I go, you know, you walk home. You know, you know, what are you gonna do? She didn't give you a ride. No, you walk. I walk home, and it was the best because I just loved fifth grade walking to school. Everyone's like, "What happened?" Getting all the tension. I was like, "Man, I would get banged up more often." <laughs> yeah, it's having a black eye then is cool. Well, I used to love to tu- oh. tube and sled. And with speaking of a country song, I, when I lived out on a, a ranch in Chugwater, Wyoming. These kids, what they they didn't they didn't have uh, sleds or tubes. What they would do, they had an old car hood, and then they would pull this car hood with a chain, and then you would just ride on that like through the snow. And I was like, "This is the My, this is a yeah. death trap of that that hood. If it hits you, is talk about bleeding." But these country kids are so much tougher than I was. I yeah, was like, poor. they're just like whatever, man. Um, that's amazing. What about? When's what was when was the last time or best time you've ever lied to get out of work? Uh, man, I mean, dude, you know what my job is? What, what do you yeah. think I lie to get out of stand up? No, yeah, only if you know what I mean. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like almost put it this way. Up until honestly, 
up until I've been doing stand up 18 years, I'd say up until seven years ago, I never missed a show. I remember one time doing a show in Culver City and I showed up. It was like an 830 show and I got there at 820 and I had left like a really fun night to go do this show. And I got there and there was no one there. There was no sign. There was no one there. And I was just like, I'm not doing it. And I just texted or even called the person whose show it was. I was like, hey, I just can't make it tonight. <laughs> so I never would like bail on shows. I was like, if I have a show, I do a show. Like it yeah. wasn't until seven years ago where I started getting to the point where I was like, you know what? Like I, I like being out with my wife and with my friends, you know? So then every now and then I would just like cancel a show. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to be able to make it. And now that I have kids, it's just like sometimes, sometimes, and a lot of times they're the reason, you know, like yeah, this little thing caught over here will get sick or a sister will get sick and you got to, and Kate's out of town. So it's usually, uh, sometimes there's nothing immediate with them, but because of them, I'm exhausted and I'm just like, I'm not going to feel bad about them being an excuse of why I need to cancel right now. You know what I mean? No, not at so all. much goes in with my wife traveling and then I got to go do shows. I'm just like, Listen, if I got to cancel once in a while and people don't understand, then you just don't, un that's fine. You know, like, just yeah. don't, you don't understand me. Yeah, you're an idiot. If you don't understand, you got to take care of your kids over a show. Um, but speak remember the days when you could? I mean, even when I was a kid, I never lied to get out of work. I would usually just forget. I remember, like, being on my couch watching <laughs> TV and my best friend, David George, would call me, who was, like, super responsible. He's, like, my best friend. And he called me and be like, Marshall, where are you? I'm like, what? I'm in my house. He's like, you used to be here at work, dude. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, all right, I'll be there. And then I got to walk across town. This is like eighth grade. I got to walk to the pizza shop, which is like a mile and a half. And I'm already a half hour late. And I remember like just being late this one time. And they had told me, like, because I've been late before, like, hey, man, next time you're late, you're done. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So I'm like walking all the way there the whole time, just like beating myself up. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to walk in here. They're going to fire me. I'm like, I'm just going to have to nip this in the butt. So I walk in. I go, all right, I'm done. And they go, they go, you're done? And I go, yeah. And they go, why? I'm like, I don't know. You know, because I'm late. And they're like, well, who, no one's firing you. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm just done. And they were like, all right. And then I had to walk home and be like, why, why'd you do that? You weren't even. Yeah. All the decisions that I made, and I'm sure you too, because there's no one around to help you make them. You no. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, there's a. Uh, I love when people say no regrets. I'm like, man, I regret a lot of these decisions. Oh, my life. Had anybody that would have just been like, hey, man, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, luckily, as an adult, I, I quit making them as much. But sometimes I'm just like, what? What's wrong with you, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> that next day, my mom like came in my room, and I was upset. And I told her, I'm like, I quit my job last night. And she's like, what? Why? And I was like, I don't know, because I was late. And I go, I don't know. Like, you know, and she could tell it was like eating at me. And my mother goes, here's the deal. You're going to call them right now. And you're going to tell them you made a mistake and tell them you want your job back. And I was like, I can't do that. She's like, you're going to. Like, trust me. It'll be fine. So I called them, and I did it, and they gave me my job back. Oh, that's awesome. And I, they fired me two years later. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I got that job back. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, speaking of shows, and like, I always try to explain to people how crazy the comedy store is now. Like, what, what's your favorite comedy store night? Do you have one that sticks out in particular? I mean, dude, there's just so many. I, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Last week, I'm standing in the hallway behind the OR, and it was a stacked lineup. Every room was a stacked lineup. And I just had like a, you know, when you just have that great set. Mm -hmm. And you're on a lineup of other great comics, and you know that, like, when people are going to talk about that night, like, the piano player came up to me after. He's like, dude, you just took that room over. Everyone was not because the room had been, like, up and down, up and down. You out of here, dude? You going to go tell mom something? All right, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he just gets up. I go, I go, you out of here? He goes, no, I'm just going to. Huh? You know, yeah, you can leave that there. He goes, oh, I'm just going to. I'm going to go tell mom something. I'm like, all right. He goes, I'll be back. I'm like, like, like it's a huge concern to me. <laughs> yeah. Do we need to pause this podcast till he gets back? <laughs> so funny. I can't um, wait. So like, <laughs> I don't even know what he's telling out. We'll find out. Yeah. So, you know, I'm out in the garage where I do the podcast and my office is here now. And then like mm -hmm. we have a little yard. You go to like, there's a door in our bedroom. So 
the piano player came up to me and was like, Deuce, he's like, you just took that room over. That room's been up and down all night. And I was like, you know, man, I go, I don't know why. There was just something in me that just like, I just, you know, like those nights where you just find something different about how you're doing your, your craft. Yeah. And so I had a really good set and then we're just standing in the back hallway and it's like, I'm standing next to Sebastian, who's arguably the biggest comedian. I mean, one of the biggest comedians in the world. Yeah. And then Whitney, Whitney Cummings is standing next to me. I mean, they're both millionaires and they're both so successful. And then Maz Jabrani's across the hall. And then like in the original, in the main room, I think Burr was on stage. No, Burr hadn't been on stage yet. So then Maz left and went up and he was bringing Sebastian up. So then when he, he ends, he's bringing up Sebastian and then Burr comes down. And then I'm like, now talking to Burr after Sebastian and Whitney and Maz. And I'm looking at all these comics and I just had a great set. And I, and I was just like on cloud nine and I'm just sitting here getting to talk to like these amazing comedians. And that's just like, you know, that's like, tip of the, those are like guys that like, I grew up when I started doing stand up when I, when I started in 2001, I used to run this room and I would invite Sebastian to come do it all the time. He was like my favorite comic fan. And uh-huh. now to see him just like, can't even get him to return an email. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah no, I, I got a um, poster up here in my studio of when I opened for Sebastian and there was maybe like 150, 175 people a show. He was doing like oh. the, the Ross bit. And now I'm like trying to explain to my girlfriend, like, no, that guy right there is the guy that you just saw on MTV hosting the, the music awards or selling out Madison Square Garden. It's crazy. Oh. Well, it was crazy. Just someone sent, mean, sent me an article yesterday. Like, here's Segura's $7 million mansion he just bought. I was like, what in the f- world is happening? I mean, it's great. I love it. Every comics are doing great. But I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, you know, that was, you know, I think there's been like a lot of special moments. I think like, you go in the bathroom, but what'd you tell mom when you went in there? Nothing? Cool. Um, <laughs> you know, there's all these like little moments that happen that like you just forget. They just sit in your subconscious somewhere and then they help make you who you are. But like, that's the, the thing that's on top of my brain. Cause I just remember sitting there being like, man, this is really cool that I get to like, yeah, but be you were- amongst. You were doing the store before it was the coolest, though, weren't you? I oh mean, yeah, you were man, still that was the... sets like the horror story. Because people always like ask me why aren't you in at the store. I was like, honestly, when I lived there in the beginning of it, the store was like it was the store, but it was like the most depressing, like awful place, and everyone hung out at the improv. No one, you'd kind of go to the stores just late night, but yeah, you know what? Like for me, because like when I started stand up, I knew nothing about stand up, mm-hmm. nothing. No, I mean, nothing. I mean, put it this way. I was seven years in, six years in the comedy and I didn't know who Bill Burr was. I didn't know who Bill Hicks was. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I still couldn't tell you a Bill Hicks joke. So like, I didn't know anything when I started. I just started a room and then, I don't know why, but the comedy store, someone got me to start going to the store, but I would never go hang out up there. I always was on the West Side. So I just go there only when I became friends with Brett Ernst and he got me a showcase. So when he got me a showcase, then I started going there, but the improv, I just looked at it like, you have no right going to the improv. Like, you <laughs> would, you gotta be careful, dude. What do you think's gonna happen? You're gonna swing that thing around, bro. I'm gonna smack you in the head once in a while. Kids whipping around an iPhone charger and smack <laughs> himself in the head. It's torture in some countries. Um, <laughs> yeah. China, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I uh, so Brett got the you in? A, That's crazy. Yeah, Brett Ernst, man. He was the one that recommended me. And then, like, I just started having to go up there and showcase. And, you know, I finally, Mitzi passed me. You know, Mitzi was the one who passed me, which was pretty special for me. Because, like, knowing all that she did for comedy was pretty amazing, you know? Yeah, that's very special. I was just going to ask if you got to see Mitzi, but that's great. Uh, wait, so who yeah. did you like when you started? Who, was the, who made you want to be a comedian? Um... I don't, I don't know, man. I, I, I tell people this all the time. Like the first time I saw stand up, I was 10 and my mom took us to see Bill Cosby. And I remember like driving home that night in my mom's car. And like my brain was watching like every joke he told. I could see the images happening in my head. We couldn't even see. We were back on the lawn. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You just listened. And then I saw, I listened to Eddie Murphy delirious on tape. When I went away to this camp that my mom ran, these other kids had it. And when they would go to class, I would listen to their stuff because, like, I wasn't in, I was just there because my mom ran this other camp. 
And then the the next time I saw stand up, I saw Chris Rock when I was like 22. But I used to watch Seinfeld special, like his last special came out before I moved to LA. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I tried it. So I didn't know. I I, I love Seinfeld the TV show. I love Robin Williams from Dead Poet Society. I didn't and Goodwill Hunting. I didn't know it one Robin Williams joke. I didn't know. Uh, I knew a little Seinfeld stuff, but like I just didn't know anything about stand up. I knew nothing. I mean, the first night I did stand up, dude, I went first. Dane Cook closed, and Ralphie May was on that show. Uh, I think Colin Quinn was on that show. I mean, dude, I knew nothing. There was a hundred and like a hundred and seventy people at the show. I went first. Wow! I did five minutes. I knew nothing about stand up. I didn't know you were going to get a light. I didn't know anything. I just knew. You need five minutes. I went there with five minutes. I did my five. I walked off. The guy was like, Jay Davis, you know, he yeah. was like, dude, that was your first time doing stand up. I was like, yeah, he goes, come back next week. I'm going to put you up every week. And I was like, all right. And uh, I, I just didn't know anything, dude. Yeah. I, I didn't know about open mic. I just looked at open mic. I'm like, I am not going to do rooms where you sit around and other comedians just sit there and judge you. How is that a positive environment? And so then I just started like doing like book shows. So I didn't know anything. Then I, like when I saw Dane that night, I remember being like, oh my God, <laughs> this is everything. You know what I mean? And, yeah. then, and then I saw who like uh, Sebastian was. It was the same way with Burr. I was moved to New York and I was doing the show and Bill Burr was on the show. I'm like, all right, I don't know who Bill Burr is. And I sat there punching a wall in the back of the room. I'm like, this is the funniest human being I've ever seen in my life. I yeah. couldn't get over it, you know? But like, I, and I had done Montreal at that point. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, good. I don't. I've been to Montreal. I didn't know who Bill Burr was. I didn't know anything. So like Sebastian became like the guy that like, I loved watching it. So I would tell him all the time, like you come to my room, whenever you want, because I just want to watch it. And like, I, I really liked Dane early on. And then Burr, like those are the three guys in comedy that I can remember watching being like, Oh man, I just like, I like how they use words. I liked how they, uh, not Burr physical, but those guys physical Burr got a little physical later, but, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. That's awesome. I didn't really have anyone that I looked to, you know. Like I, me- I remember reading when uh, Sandy, uh, Steve Martin's book. That's the only like stand-up book I've ever read. I don't. I feel like I'm just not a fan of stand-up. Like I should be. Like, you know, you hear of like well, these guys. They like, yeah, you know. But I think it's like I think people sometimes say what they think you want to hear because like I'm the same. I mean, I grew up in Wyoming. I just didn't know what stand-up was. I chickened out forever. I didn't know what an open mic was. I didn't know. I was, I'm with you, like, my first time, I didn't know Bill Hicks or any of that. I, I saw Mitch Hedberg on TV, and then I saw, like, uh, the Here's Your Sign guy open up for a country band, and then <laughs> I just kind of, I didn't know either. And I, I think Steve Martin, that's the only book I ever read as far as comedy-wise. Yeah. And then I went through a thing where I watched all of it. And now, unfortunately, you know what? I can barely watch any of it. Unless it's live. If it's someone I like, I could see live, but we put on Netflix specials, and I'm like, Ah, man, I, I mean, people I like, I'm just like, I don't know. I just can't really watch it. Yeah, live is so much better. You know what's funny? This is the other person that influenced me. I did a triple run. You ever do a triple yeah. run? Right of passage. So I'm on a triple awful. run. I know. To the worst. But Pete Johansson was the headliner, and I was the feature. And he was telling me, about, he's like, you ever heard of Nick Swartzen? I'm like, no. I'm like, oh, man, you would love him. You would love him, just like based on my comedy. Uh-huh. And we're like eating lunch one day in this like cool bar at a hotel. And he asked him to put on Comedy Central and Sarah Swartz and doing his half hour. He goes, this is Nick Swartz. And I, so I had never been to the improv. Okay. I'd never been to the improv and I have been doing stand up now three years. Uh, yeah, like three years, no, two and a half years at this point on this trouble run. And then Pete Johansson was like, yo, um, when we get back to LA, it was like, we were getting back to LA, like in two days, he goes, I'm going to the improv Thursday night. Why don't you come meet me? And I was like, okay. And sure enough, Swartzen was there. And then like a couple of people who I just got to know. So I met Swartzen. I'm like, Oh, Hey man. And you know, Pete introduced us. And I told him I work at the world cafe and he goes, dude, I live in Venice. So he started coming into world cafe and then he and I became friends and I loved his comedy. He was so funny. And he's just like the funniest dude of all time off stage. And so then I started opening for him. So he was another one. It was like Nick, Dane, Sebastian Burr, a comedian that like I started like digging when uh, when I was in the game. Before the game, it was Rock, Seinfeld, Cosby. 
Well, you probably got to meet most of all. I mean, obviously the guys you just said, but so who who have you met that made you the most nervous? Um, uh, I, I think the person that made me the most nervous is, was Rogan. Yeah, which makes sense. Just because he's so like alpha, and I'm like, I'm into, uh, I'm into like full floral arrangements you know what i mean i just feel like oh he's gonna he's gonna hate me you know and uh he i don't think i don't know if he does but like some guys that are like i just don't know how to act around them now because i'm like oh they're gonna think i want them from yeah well yeah that's a whole different la world that i no longer have to live in i don't that's <laughs> i was jealous about everything yeah. but that i don't have to worry about anymore but yeah he's i remember first time i met him two things i was like he's scary and he's shorter than i thought I thought he was. Yeah, and he was actually like one of the nicest guys yeah, yeah, ever. He was, he was so nice to me. He was cool to me too. I probably overthought it, but and I didn't. I I, <laughs> I ended up at a dinner with him, and I tried to like make small talk, and I just think he could. You could just see the fear. Of, I don't. I just didn't know what the fuck. I, it's embarrassing now to think I was trying to talk pool with him and shit. But yeah, he's he's pretty <laughs> he's pretty intimidating. I had like an opening yeah, question, and then I had no follow up. I'm like, what? What? You're so dumb. Just eat your food and hope he pays for it because I don't have any money. <laughs> And he did, so it was cool. I met, yeah, of course. <laughs> I met Kevin Hart, and I never knew who he was too. That was like 2007, oh, and yeah? he was the nicest human being ever. I couldn't believe how goddamn nice he was, and he was just a guy. And then, like, it was like years later, and I was like, "Holy shit, I know that guy!" You know, like he interviewed me for South Beach Comedy Festival, and I was just you know whoever, and he obviously was tracking. He knew where he was going. Yeah. Well, I, I said, but I'm, yeah, just. All the time that the comics are the coolest. Once once you're in this, I've never. I always the bigger the comic, the cooler they've been to me. Yeah. Um, the other one that I was I wasn't nervous about because I was just in a really good place in my life, but I did fuck it up. Was Larry David? Oh wow! <laughs> I did Curb last year, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be unbelievable. I'm on set with Larry David all day. I'm gonna be like. I'm going to talk golf. I'm going to, it's going to be amazing. Uh -huh. I'm a comedian. So we're in the middle of a, like in between scenes and he's like practicing his, practicing his golf swing with no club in his hand, just practicing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, he's going to love this. So I come up from behind I put my hands on his hips. I'm like, Larry, you got to power through. You got to shift these hips right here, man. And he fucking did not like that. Oh no. He, he <laughs> turned and looked at me. <laughs> with such disgust on his face, like who are you to ever? My friends are like, you touched Larry David. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you not know anything? And I'm like, I just thought to be hilarious. They're like, yeah, not for him, dude. For oh us, my God. of how big of a jackass you are. And like, he walked away, dude. We were like on set waiting. He walked all the way down to Video Village and like waited back there for like ten minutes. And I was like, <laughs> oh shit. Well, it's gonna end up in an episode for sure. I, I can't wait to see the season to see if you put it in because it, I, mean, that, I mean so perfect for the show and I I like that I could see it going that's either something he I mean I would think it's funny but I'm also not Larry David but I love that you went for it oh. dude I have put my foot in my mouth so many times in this business thinking something would be funny and thinking people would get it and then it blew up in my face one time so much so that like it it completely affected my career. 100%. It took me back like three years. But that moment right there, I was like, now I'm past this now. This is like, I'm on his level. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you know what I didn't do? What I would do in the past was I would let that affect me so much that I would mm -hmm. get crazy anxiety and insecure. And I didn't. I was just like, you know what? That's in him, dude. Yeah. You're, you're on set. You're a part of the show right now. I know you're just a day player and you're here for one day, but you know what? Fuck that. You know? That's yeah. the way I looked at it. Wait, without going into details on the other one, can you just give us an idea of what you did that fucked it all up? You might know that story. I was like, I was like in the running for this pilot with these two female comedians that were run. It was their show, and they loved me. Like they loved me, and uh -huh. they did a couple things in the process that, like, you would just in a professional setting, you would never do. You would just never like in my audition. They were, they were laughing so hard. They were going, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up mm -hmm. because they were loving what was happening. Like it became, you know, that was at the first audition. And then like we got on the, we had a phone call with the director of the pilot cause they, they just like 
set this thing up. Like I was going to get this show. Like Fred Savage was directing the pilot. We all got on a phone call. They were prepping me for the callback. Then when I got to the callback, they told me, don't even bother signing in. Like we were all like super tight. And then my callback was 50 minutes long. Like they were, Mm -hmm. it was like a serious chemistry test. And I ended up not getting it. And my manager called me. We, we, we shared the same manager, me and these girls. And she's like, Hey, I was like, hey, and she's like, so you didn't get it. And I was like, oh, I didn't. She's like, no. And she's like, but listen, you made a ton of fans at CBS. Everybody loved you over there. I had a the production company that was making the show already had a general set up for me and wanted to like talk about like developing something for me. Mm-hmm. Like, bye, big guy. I'll see you later, okay? All right, love you. We're almost easy. Okay, bye. And, uh, and like all this stuff. And then she goes, so listen, the girl's, wanted to call you and tell you because they were so bummed you didn't get it but I told them I wanted to call you but they're going to call you over the weekend and I was like okay cool and like we had gotten along so well I changed my outgoing message to be like hey what's up it's Jay I'm not here unless it's so and so and so and so if it's you don't bother leaving a message thanks for ruining my life all this stuff you know (laughs) Yeah. so they never call me now it's Monday. My manager calls me about something else. And I go, hey, you know, the, the girls never called. And she's like, oh, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure they'll get around to it. It's like, oh, okay. I go, because, you know, I, I changed my outgoing message to be this funny message towards them. And she goes, oh, my God, that's hilarious. I'll tell them to call you right now. So then I see, like, one of their numbers pop up. I let it go to voicemail. They leave no message. My manager calls me back 20 minutes later. She's like, hey, the girls said they called you, but it was just like a normal, like, outgoing message. And I'm like, oh, really? And she goes, yeah. And I'm like, oh, maybe I didn't like save it. She's like, oh, she's like, why don't you just call them now? Uh So I go, okay. And I called them and I got their voicemail. And the reason I didn't get the show was because these two girls had never had their own show. So the network was like, listen, if we're taking a chance on you, we need the supporting people around you to be more established. And they said like, I was a little too green. So like I, I left, I got their voicemail and I was like, well, 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 guess who it is? Yup, the guy you didn't give the show to. Oh, why? Because I'm green? CBS thinks I'm green? You know who else is green? Kermit the Frog? Nobody had a problem with Kermit? I did this whole, dude, four, four minutes. Joking. Yeah. Hilarious. They're telling me to fuck off and shut the fuck up in an audition because they're laughing so hard. And I do this, right? Yeah. Uh, hour later, I get a phone call from the producer who had the production company and their manager on a, on a two-way call. Hey, Jay, uh, it's so-and-so and so-and-so. Can you please give us a call back? Uh, thanks so much. I go, All right. I call my manager. She's not there. I call their manager. Not there. I call the producer. I get him. And I'm like, hey, man, it's Jay Larson. And he goes, what the fuck, dude? Oh, no. And I go, what? And he goes, what the fuck is going on? I heard that voice that you left for the girls. What are you, out of your fucking mind? And I go, I go, what? I go, that's a, I go, that was a joke. And he goes, yeah, I listened to it. Didn't sound like a joke. Oh, God. And I'm like, what do you, I go, yes, it was. He goes, yeah, well, they don't think so, man. I go, well, I'll call them right now. He goes, do not call them. Do not call them. This is how serious it was, Brent. I'm like, okay. I hang up the phone. I call my manager again. I don't get her. She calls me back like two hours later. She's like, what the fuck is going on? I go, where have you been? She's like, I've been in casting all day. She's like, what is going on? What happened? And I start telling her. And she goes, oh, and I go, I go, you know that this is a joke, right? And she's like, I, just let me call their manager. And I, I, I'm like, you knew I was, I told you. I told yeah. you I was making a joking. So she calls their manager, calls me back, and says, listen, the girls are pretty shook up about your message, and they don't want you to call them. And I go, uh. can I email them and explain myself? And she's like, let me check with their manager. And she calls them back. She's like, no, you can't email them. They don't, they don't want to ever hear from you ever again in your life. Jeez. And I was like, for so a- like a week goes by and I'm like, so distraught. Like now my manager is not calling me that much. The meeting at the production company got canceled. They like said, no, we don't want to have a meeting with them. I obviously didn't get the show. Finally, I call my manager. I'm like, here's the deal. I'm writing an email and I'm going to send it to you. If you think it's okay, you can send it to their manager. If their manager thinks it's okay, she can send it to them. And she's like, okay. And I'm like, all right, bye. I was so pissed. I wrote this like amazing email. Like I would, you know, like explaining, like Jesus, like, what do you think I am? 
and my manager, I sent it to her and she called me. She's like, that's like a, that was a really beautiful email. I'm like, yeah, well, what do you think? What, what do you think I am? What do you, what do you think? And then her, her man, their manager was like, yeah, beautiful email, sending it off. And, uh, never heard anything. Two weeks later, one of the girls called my manager or emailed my manager and said, tell Jay, we appreciated his email. And that was it. I've never seen either of them ever again. I've never, after that happened, dude, I mean, so then my manager just became, started to become a ghost with me. Mm-hmm. I end up like, like I, I got to a point where like it would go three months before she would call me back. And that happened twice. And the second time I'm like, listen, you know, I ha- like, she like, after like I got on the phone, she's like, listen, if this ever happens again, just like text me and tell me this is like, needs me. and I go, I go, listen, they, there can't be a next time. Like, yeah. I can't respect myself. And so it happened again and I fired her. You know, and yeah. then I like took me a long time. It just like put everything on hold. I was like had such great momentum going, and then like all that shit went down. Yeah. And it's like I told the story to like Swartzen, who was friends with those girls, who was a really good friend of mine, Kumel. He was like, they were all like in in like distraught, like sick to this stomach. Like, how? Here's yeah. the worst part. Are you ready for this? Uh-oh. They made the pilot with a, a known actor. Uh, Adam Pally, who's on that new Dan Levy show. He was on a, a series already. The pilot got picked up the series. He couldn't do it, so they recast it with an unknown, with a no name. Oh. So that could have been me. Yeah. Or two, I could have just been in the writer's room. They could have been like, oh, we love this guy. Put him in the writer's room. But... Jesus. Yeah, bro. So uh, just the job. Larry David thing. <laughs> it's nothing. I was like, please. What am I? I'm not going to get another fucking bit part on. Yeah. God. The worst part is on this on the curb episode. They put me in a ski mask, dude. I'm in a ski mask the whole time. Oh, really? So you, they don't. Nobody even knows it's you. No I, one. No one knows me. I ran into the director at a screening, and I was like, "Hey, man, how are you?" He's like, "Oh, hey, Jay." And I'm like, "Hey, man." And uh, he goes, uh, "By the way, sorry about ski mask, dude." <laughs> <laughs> and I go. I go, nah, it's fine. I go, trust me. I was a little bent because I'm like, no one's going to believe me. I'm like, but it was such a great experience. And Richard Lewis was the nicest guy of all time. So oh, it, was, awesome. it was fun. Wait, it hasn't aired yet, has it? It's the upcoming season? No, it hasn't aired yet. Oh. I think it's like Larry was on Seth Meyers the other night. So I'm guessing it's coming out. So soon. he's starting to push it. Well, do you enjoy yeah. acting? Do you, do, you like have, do you like acting? I like, you know what I like, dude? I like creating. I like being around creative people. I like the idea that people are taking people are taking nothing and turning it into something. Like anytime you see a movie, you don't understand that. Like, I mean, maybe people do. I just it always blows my mind that someone decided somewhere. For me, it's in this garage. They sat down at a computer or a typewriter or a pen and paper, and they started writing this idea for a story. And from that, they got people to believe in it enough to get them money that people will work for it, and then you know, you're a part of a production. So I like acting cause you're just like, you're kind of doing your thing. I don't mm-hmm. think it's like my strong suit. You know what I mean? Like I've yeah. done some movies that were like a lot of fun, but there's so much, so much other shit that is so, it seems way more important than the acting that goes into projects that I like acting. But for me, the idea of producing and like being a part of an idea or writing something and then putting it together, it's just, it's more exciting to me. And I don't know if that's cause I just, that's what I feel like I'm better at, or I just don't like, um, you know, dude, I honestly, I say this, I feel like 90% of the actors in the world are just whatever. 10% yeah. are super talented. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. look at like, look at the actors you see in movies and TV, like Vince Vaughn. I love watching him, but that guy's not a fucking talent. He's not an actor. He's just funny. Yeah. Yeah, they just. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but like Daniel Day Lewis, that's a fucking actor. Yeah. Meryl Streep, that's a goddamn actor. You know what I mean? I just, I don't know if I have the talent to do what like super great people do. And do I think I'm as funny as Vince Vaughn? No fucking way. I, I love that man. I think he's super, super funny. But like, I know that when it comes to like seeing something that's funny or writing and stuff, I don't know. I feel like I just get more of a rush out of it, and it just allows me to like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. be a more normal person i don't know i like being normal i feel like stand up and acting is like just for such crazy people you know yeah 
Well, here's something I talk about you a lot because I think you're ahead of the curve. Like I like I love like Andrew Schultz now, and I like everybody doing shit themselves. And I always refer back to you because I had I just had such admiration and respect when you're like, fuck it, I'm making my own special. I'll shoot it myself. I'll do it myself. And I was there, and it turned out awesome. I I still think you have the best set I've ever seen with those lights. But do you? I don't know what I'm trying to ask you with you, but like you were ahead of that. Do you? In hindsight, do you regret doing it, or do you, or do you think that's the way stand-up's going? Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, the, I don't regret it because I don't ever want to. If I regretted it, then I would be really hard for me to tell my kids as they get older, like to like go for shit. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That was me going for it. That was me believing in myself, believing that I could, that I was good enough to sell a special, that I was good enough. And I was, I, I still, I still stand behind that hour. I, I yeah. do believe in that hour. I do think it's really good. I was able to do whatever I wanted. I did that story about my dad at the end that I think is like really unique. I don't think that's something that people do on specials. Now, if you look at it from a financial standpoint, did I make my money? I didn't even make my money back. You know what I mean? So I didn't, I never sold it anywhere to get more mass appeal, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't. So like, if you look at it like this, so you look at like, let's take Segura. He's done all these specials on Netflix. He's crushing it. Um, other comedians are like Bargazzi or everything. Just, he's going to go straight to Netflix. They're going to get these ideas. Mm-hmm. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, you take a guy like Andrew Schultz. He shoots a special. Nobody wants it. He puts it on YouTube, gets a million views. Now he's crushing, selling out, doing theaters, destroying, making bank. And neither of those things happened for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I kind of looked at him like, fuck, ah, Jesus Christ, where do I even fit? You know, like Netflix isn't knocking down. Like you got to be on. I remember saying to my agent, like towards the end of last year, I'm like, yo, can we like talk to Netflix about even just doing like a 15 minute special? Like I have that hour. And he's like, he basically, they, I like my agents to shoot me straight. They're like, listen, man, they have lists and you're just not on them. Mm-hmm. So like, I guess it's like, I'm like, just so it, does it not matter how good I am or am I not as good as I think I am? Because it's not like I'm putting it out to the public. I'm not putting it out to the public and having like this resounding, uh, like following based off of what I'm doing. Now I know my stand up right now tends to lean more towards like family and adult, but it's edgy. I don't know. It's why like, I just, it's the only reason I keep on plugging. Cause I'm like, man, I still haven't found what it is that I'm, supposed to be doing you know what i mean like i get lucky and get some acting work that's on really good projects but i'm not like no one's busting out my door and then i do stand up and like some stuff like that wrong number that like you know yeah. it got got really popular and i made that hour that anyone it seems who watches it is like yo this is fucking amazing well yeah but, but yet, no one's- there's so much luck though into it. like i and like I said, I was inspired. I, I feel this way about my book. I didn't sell it to, I didn't, I just self published it and did it. But the, the one part I always tell people to do it like you did and what I did is I'm so fucking proud of this book and no one can ever take that away. And I, I would imagine you feel the same way about that special. And if something, if I ever do pop, there's shit waiting. And, and like I was at, I've seen a million specials and I don't want to shit on people or say that there's a magical. Uh, there's a cheat code in this game, but in a weird way, like, I, like there's guys that have specials that got a lot of traction, and your special is way better than theirs. Is. They just happen. Yeah, I appreciate that. They just happen to be on a certain podcast three times, which I think is the new. I mean, I, I don't even have to beat around the bush. I think if you get Rogan three times, it changes your life. Oh yeah, I mean, I think and if I, you get Rogan one time, it well, I mean, your it, life. it's a small change, but I think like some of the guys like that got some specials there was definitely a rogan factor that uh i don't know yeah i, I just and like it, there's like i don't know i just like how you did it because you just did it and believed in yourself and put up your own money which i've talked to people in this business and i told them how you did it and then they but i can just see that they're just pussies and they're scared and i was like you'll never make it because you don't even believe in yourself to start with well that was my whole philosophy i'm like how can i keep going into rooms pitching ideas and asking these people to put their jobs on the line and give me money. If I believe in myself so much, why don't I put my money where my mouth is? I have the money to spend it. Now, dude, I got a wife and two kids and I'm taking 
I'm taking what could, I mean, we rent a, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. If I had that money right now, you know, you can't, I mean, you can't you live can't your life. Live like that. No, no, but, no, because it could have gone a whole different way. <laughs> yeah. But that would have been a lot of help for us to try and buy a house, but yeah. that wasn't the whole point. And my wife would never want that. My wife is like the most amazing supportive woman. And she's like, no, yeah, go fucking, you know what she told me that she's like, you gotta go make more stuff. Like you have got to make more stuff. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I just, I appreciate you digging it. And I still do dig it. And I feel like I have some new stuff now that I'm like, you know, it's also why I'm like, I feel like sometimes even being in the industry and I'm at the store and I'm like, you know, have traction with some other ideas and some other projects. I'm like, I think I need to keep doing stuff that's out of outside the box and kind of come at the industry from a different angle in an angle where it's like, guess what? I don't fucking need you at all. Yeah. I can go do. And so that's why I'm like putting on my producer hat more because I'm like, you know what? I just want to work at the end of the day. I love acting. I really love stand up. I really love writing, but what I want to do is just work. I yeah. want to be around cool people that are creative and I want to make, I want to make content, not to just make content because I, but for things that I believe in and what things that I think people will enjoy, you know, I don't want to just fucking make TikTok videos because people will consume the fuck out of them because they have nothing else in their life. I yeah. still want to like try and produce and make things that, you know, like that was the whole point of putting that story about my dad on there. I was like, you know, I fucking lived this. I went through it and I know other people going through it or have, so why not put it out there and, you know, allow my special to be something bigger than just jokes. Yeah. I just, I don't know. To be and special. I look at people, it was special. Yeah, make it special. Yeah, yeah. And I look at people that are like in in amazing positions of power in stand up right now. Their followings are huge. And they use it for nothing. Like fucking nothing. Are you promoting and I'm not saying you gotta have a message behind everything, but like the fucking yeah. world is burning down. <laughs> it's fucking yeah, yeah. burning. <laughs> and yeah. you just you're just like, No, nope, I'm just gonna fuck everyone everything's for me and i'm just like oh i just can't get my head around that ideal it yeah just, it's just not i can't come from that place so um i just keep i'm like well i've tried i've tried a lot of different angles and i've had i i feel like that story i told you about those two girls was yeah. bad luck i don't i don't think that was me being a fucking idiot i think that was a bit of bad luck maybe i could have seen it from a different perspective i don't know yeah. Even, I, I just don't know. And I've had some other moments in my life that I'm like, ah, oh, shit, maybe. Uh, but at the end of the day, I look at it, Brent and uh, everyone out in this town. At the end of the day, I was looking at him like I moved here with $3,200 in my pocket, $26,000 student loan debt. Yeah. And I bet that that is that is probably exponentially way less money than anyone that moves here. I mean, I know people that move here with $900. You yeah. know what I mean? They have nothing. But there's so many people who just move here with crazy legs up. So for where I'm at now, and I have these two amazing kids, and I have an amazing wife, and I don't own my home, but I like like I'm staying in my backyard right now, and I look around and I'm like, fuck, I'm so goddamn lucky to look at a, a crystal blue sky and go into this little garage that I love, and I can do work in, and I create in there, and my kids toys are out here and my wife's going to come home later and I'm going to make dinner for them and they're going to go to bed and my wife and I are going to watch a movie and I'm like why do I need a fucking seven million dollar home no if yeah. I could afford one would I buy one no yeah. you know what I mean no I live in a neighborhood where houses are getting bulldozed down for 1.6 million and people are building four million dollar houses for fucking what so some rich family can fucking move in there that relates to nobody around them no yeah. do I want to live in a fucking dated neighborhood no do i want to be able to go on public and talk to strangers yes yeah i fucking hate the way the world is going and the idea of celebrity is getting even crazy maybe it's just getting crazier because we're around it so much now because we're like further on in the business but it's like celebrity was never something i wanted to get into this business for you know what i mean it yeah. was always just to tell stories and to entertain people and make people make people feel good at the end of the day that's what i liked about stand-up like oh i like people feeling good and leaving with something positive. I always wanted people to leave my stand up feeling different about the way they approach life than before they saw my stand up. That was always the point. 
Yeah. So that's why I'm like, well, maybe I try different angles because right now that's just not what's popping off, you know? Yeah. Well, shit changes all the time. It's a crazy business. Well, yeah, I, I love you, buddy. You are so good to me. From you've always been good to me, but I always tell people, and and like I did tell that story. I you inspired me. I'm I'm like you. I'm sitting. I have a girl that supports me. I'm. We have a two bedroom house, but the the other room is just a whole podcast room, and and I love it. I, I don't have a seven million dollar house or anything, but I love coming down to this room and and doing shit like this. So I know you're busy. So thank you for taking the time and and, and talking to me. And uh, get out to Denver. You are you doing much road stuff? Or are you sticking around L. A. Um, you know me, dude, I try to like, if I do 12 weekends a year, I'm totally fine with that. But it's Mm -hmm. still like, um, you know, when you don't do the road a lot, it doesn't open up a lot of the road doors. Um, so I'm doing a little bit. I've, I've been dying to, I hit my agent all the time. I'm like, yo, what about comedy work? What about comedy work? What about comedy work? And they just don't. They don't give me shine. I did the, the landmark one once, the further one out, yeah, yeah. the fill-in date. I thought I did really well, and they've never had me to downtown. So, well, you know, I, I stop worrying about these clubs that just don't, yeah, yeah, don't bring me. I'm just like I keep have to. I used to all get so frustrated, like, what is why is it me? And then I just got to the point. I'm like, fuck it. Yeah. Fuck yeah. It. Well, no, now I'm trying to chase the people that don't want you. You know. Yeah. Well, and then again, it's stuff that now learning the business. Is, I'm always like, why? Because I'm close with everybody here, so a lot of times I'm like, why do we book this person? And they're like, well, we have to book this person to get that person. And I'm like, oh, there's so much for this shit. doesn't really matter of who's yeah. there or what. So, well, I'll put, a, I'll put a bug in their ear. I'm there every night, and, um, and they're, uh, they're good to me, so I'll definitely say something. So, Well, I'm glad you're doing good, right, man. Buddy. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time. You I know it, you're busy, and uh, if I get back out there, our, 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 cross will, our pass will cross noon, so... Yeah, man. Next time you're out, let me know. We'll come have you on the through line, baby. I would love to, buddy. I'll let you know for sure. All right, man. All right, love buddy. you, brother. I you love you, buddy. See ya. That's my boy, Jay Larson, out here trying to do it. He, uh, Him and Ryan Sickler were so good to me in the beginning. The first, first, like, I would say, like, I don't know, who knows what fame is or whatever, but LA is so weird, but they were so, uh, so good to me when they didn't have to be, so I will always uh, root for both of them. And I enjoyed talking to him. He's a great he's a great storyteller and what a fucking awful story that is that this chick just <laughs> I mean, if you got Kermit the Frog in there, it can't be that serious. I don't unless he said he was butt fucking Kermit the Frog in there. I have no idea, but I think shit happens for a reason. I, I talked about it at the other podcast the other day. There's there's days in my life where just one little move would it I wouldn't be sitting right here talking to you guys. But um who knows? I think it all the shit works out. And like he said, he I'd trade him in a second. He has a wife and two kids and seems pretty sweet to me. It was cute to to have his son in the background and uh that's uh that is what I someday dream of. But anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. That's my boy Jay Larson. I had a lot of fun talking to him. That was a fast hour. I, I trick these guys. I'm always if you guys would see the text messages, it's like, hey man, let me just talk to you for like twenty minutes. <laughs> And I know I can usually get them to keep going, so we're we're getting full thirty. I don't. We didn't get to thirty one questions, but and you know it's crazy. I don't think we 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 didn't hit any of the the questions from his his episode two he did with me. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I love talking to him. Uh, you know what it is. Follow us the thirty one podcast on Instagram. Follow me on all social media. Brant Tobler. Um, if you want me to come to your town, send me a message. Brant Tobler at Gmail or Brant at Brant dot com. As always, thank you to Tone Gordon for putting out the dopest shit for us. I can't thank him enough for all he does for the podcast, just making cool shit. If you go to the YouTube, he's cutting up old clips. He's putting together stuff. He's making animations. He uh, is just incredible. So thank you, Tone, as always. Thank you to the Patreons. And just thank you guys for listening. You got a, you got a, a, a inside look to Hollywood. No one, this, all these people in Hollywood, they don't know shit. We just do it ourselves. That's why I'm in the content factory. So anyway, uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode because I know I did. Goodbye. Brand's over, trying to expand globally. Long curly hair and a beard, but he ain't Toby Keith. 
You might have thought it's beef, but we gon' handle that. Stealing jerseys off of the wall like fuck Banda Jack. Okay, he ran with that, and now he's on the loose. Put a little bit of poison in his jamba juice. Go ahead and drink on that, just take another sip. Need an appraisal? Shout out to Ron Huff and Dick. The kids loving this. I know you heard it, son. The purpose is perfect. Every person we learn something from. Go ahead and come along. We have a little fun. A few questions. How about 31?